All right, I am back. <laughs> Finally, I'm rolling up my sleeves here. I have really long arms, and I tend to have most of my flannels fit me decent up here and things and in here, but then my arms are, I go like this, and they're coming up like that, too short. But I uh, <laughs> uh, want to get some videos done, but I've just had uh, some real busy times here and suffered with a little bit of uh, sickness yesterday, just a headache that... Uh, well, it got real bad yesterday, but um, if you know anything, I suffer with headaches. I try a lot of different things, and it's just a continual battle. Looking forward to my incorruptible body. But um, got a couple of videos to record today. I'm going to start out with a letter that uh, we received in the mail here. I'm not going to be giving out any kind of names here, but um, sometimes I'll reply to a letter on a you know just write back personally. But uh, when they ask some really good questions, um, I'll answer it in a video because I know that there are some other people out there that might be struggling with the same things. So to the brother that wrote this, I hope you don't mind that I'm answering this in a public video. I won't be giving your name or anything or address, of course. Obviously, I protect that. But uh, we'll read here. Uh, it says, Dear Brian Denlinger, I want to start off by saying thank you for ministering through your, your YouTube videos. You have answered many questions about the Holy Bible, KJV, that have bothered me for years. Uh, I have just a few questions that really bother me. Please, if you could provide me with straightforward answers on the following few questions, please. Okay? Not a problem. I can definitely do that. Question number one. I have my arms covered in tattoos that I had done about five years ago. I have repented since then, and I know now I have defiled God's holy temple, and it has eaten me up since then. I know all sins are forgiven, or excuse me, forgivable, um, except for taking Mark of the Beast and blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Uh, here's the question. Even though I got tattooed before I got saved, do you think this sin will prevent me from entering God's kingdom? Um, and he has his tattoos listed here. I, that's personal. I don't need to get into all that. I am willing to get laser removal, but I, I figure Jesus will return any day, so I have just worn a long sleeve shirt for five years. Okay, Christians with tattoos on them from previous lost life. Uh, first of all, let me give you the scripture here on the thing of tattoos. Um, the way you interpret things in scripture is you look through the Bible, and if there's something in the Old Testament that has been set up and there's no clear New Testament scripture saying um, this is done away. Okay, um, one of the questions coming up is about the thing of unclean, clean and unclean animals. Okay, um, the thing of the unclean animals in the Old Testament, that's been done away in the New Testament. I'm going to show you the scriptures on that in just a minute. But the prohibition against getting a tattoo, there's nothing in the New Testament undoing that. All right. Um, there's a concept here in the Bible, okay, and that is that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. So you're not to defile the, the temple. Let me give you the scriptures here quickly. Leviticus chapter 19, um, verse 28. Ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Okay, now it's interesting because tattoos, modern tattoos, actually do both. They make cuttings in your flesh, and a lot of times people will get... You know, I've seen people with tattoos up here or something, you know, and they'll have a tattoo in memory of somebody that died. Okay, the tattoo is a needle, the little thing that they use there, and they're carving in your skin, and then they've put ink down into that. That's why it's not like they just put a stamp on you and then it washes off after so many times in the shower. No, no, it's a cutting in your flesh that's filled with ink. And that way when it heals over, then you have the thing there permanently. Right, so you have, it makes a cutting in the flesh, many times for the dead, and you're not to print any marks upon you. So, they say, but that's Old Testament under the law. Okay, but see, here's where you rightly divide the word of truth. You go and you say, all right, all scripture is given for, by inspiration of God. Um, let, me get the, let me get the verse. I'm, I'm got a million other things in my head right now. Got a lot to catch up on. 1 Timothy. <clears throat> uh Wait, I think it's 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Yeah. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. The things that are written back in the Old Testament are written for our learning. Okay, it says that in another portion of Scripture. So you read the Old Testament and you say, hmm, that's an interesting law there. Is there anything in the New Testament that undoes that? And like I said, the thing of unclean animals. That's been undone in the New Testament. But there's nowhere in the New Testament that says you can now print marks upon you and make cuttings in your flesh for the dead. And if you look at the context back there in Leviticus chapter um, 19, um, verse 26, it says, Ye shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment nor observe times. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So right there, verse 27, just to give you a perfect example, verse 26, Acts 15, you have the council there, and they said, what, what should we tell the Gentiles? The Jewish apostles are meeting, and they say, tell them not to eat things, you know, sacrifice to idols, or, and to abstain from blood. Things strangled and, and to abstain from blood, basically, is what they're saying. Well, you're seeing it right there in Le Leviticus 19, verse 26. So see, that carries into the New, into the New Testament there. It's not, well, in the Old Testament, you couldn't drink, drink blood, but now in the New Testament, we can. No, no, no. It carries in. It's in Acts chapter 15. You can compare Scripture with Scripture. What about verse 27? Ye shall not round the corners of your heads. I'm in disobedience. Oh, but wait. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 talks about if a man has long hair, it's a shame unto him. So no, I'm not in disobedience. You see, I have short hair. Why? Because I'm a man. All right. And you know, how long is long and how you know, we're not even going to get into all that stuff. If you're, if you have a haircut that's feminine or whatever else that people can confuse you for being a woman, if they look at you from behind or whatever, uh, get a haircut. Okay. Um, you should have a, a manly style of hair. You don't have to have it as short as mine. I, I understand that. But the point is, see, see how you compare scripture? Verse 26 in Leviticus 19 is still there, binding for today, Acts chapter 15. All right, Paul's there present, so you can't say, well, Paul line epistles. Uh, you know, yeah. Paul's right there in Acts 15. Verse 27, ye shall not round the corners of your heads. Wait a second, Paul said, if a man has long hair, it's a shame unto him. So this, verse 27, has been undone. Verse 28, ye shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you, I am the Lord. Why are they making cuttings for the dead, cuttings in their flesh for the dead, and printing marks upon them. It's, pe it's pagan, heathen practice. That's what's going on there. It's a, it's a heathen thing. I mean, you look at the faraway tribes and stuff, some of the ones that are really cut off from the modern world and whatever else, they'll make cuttings in their flesh. They put these big wooden things through their ears and, you know, they, they mutilate the flesh. There's this thing of mutilating the flesh. All right, I remember this one tribe, I forget what it was, where it was at, India or something like that, but they would they would take a rock and they'd, they'd knock the woman's front teeth out. And that was considered attractive. See, it's a pagan thing to mutilate the flesh. This body, God's given it to you. Okay? Don't mutilate it. Right? And you say, well, then what, what would be the tie-in there, verse 28 in the New Testament? Well, talked about the thing of defiling the temple. <clears throat> uh, your body is, is like a temple. Basically, uh, let's see here. Okay, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. There should be a clear distinction between a Christian's body and the bodies of lost heathen. All right. And if you have all kinds of tattoos and stuff like that, well, God's not going to look at you and say, sorry, you know, the question here from this brother was, you know, um, uh, do you think this sin will prevent me from entering God's kingdom? No, no. Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. So you come to the Lord as a sinner and you say, please save me, he'll save you. And you can be a former sodomite, you can be transgender, whatever, but don't think that you can go and continue, by the way, in the transgender thing. You need to switch back and, and be thankful for how God made you. 
All right, don't give me this stuff. Well, oh, well, I'm confused about my gender. Okay, go into the bathroom, you know, take a shower and, you know, look down and that's what God made you to be. All right, don't give me this stuff. But uh, <clears throat> the first question there, what about the thing of tattoos? Uh, well, if you're a Christian and you have tattoos, uh, the, the laser surgery thing, um, from what I've been told, from what I've heard, it doesn't work. A lot of the times it's very expensive, uh, very painful, and quite frankly, it doesn't work. Um, you'll still have scars and things there. If you have tattoos, I've known Christians with tattoos, um, do your best to cover them. Um, using, use it as an opportunity to witness. If you can't cover it up, if it's someplace that's very, um, you can't do anything about it, okay. Just, you know, when you're witnessing to somebody, you see their eyes drop down and say, you know, I can prove to you I was a sinner. I mean, look at this. Look at these arms and tattoos and whatever else. Uh, I'm a sinner, you know. But Jesus Christ saved even a vile person like myself. You see, that's how the thing works. I mean, we all have scars from our past. Um, some are more visible than others, but uh, no, the Lord's not going to keep you out of heaven or some kind of a thing like that. Okay, the Lord does not... You know, when you get saved, God's, that blood that He shed on the cross, uh, He purchases you, purchases you with that blood. All right, the full price is paid there, all right, at the cross. That price was paid. His righteousness is now imputed to you. All right, so His perfect sinless life is now put on your account, and your wickedness and your evil and your tattoos and your whatever other things that you've done is now put on Jesus Christ at the cross. All right, it's paid for. All right, so don't get any more tattoos. Okay, don't don't think to yourself, well, you know, it's okay, you know, that my, the blood of Jesus Christ washed away my sins and past, present, future, so I can get tattoos in the future. Uh, you want to get out of fellowship with the Lord real quickly, and have the Lord uh, have to chasten you hard for something. Um, yeah, <laughs> don't get tattoos after you're saved. Question number two. I hunt elk, deer, cougar, and bear. New Testament says old law has passed and we are under grace. Question. Are we as KJV Bible-believing Christians to refrain from Old Testament unclean animals? No. How do you know? Because, let me look it up here. I always get my first and seconds messed up. Just a, an issue that I have. Uh... 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, I always get these. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 4. I always think, is it 1 or 2 Timothy? 1 and 2 Corinthians is the same thing. I had a terrible time remembering the number that goes before and, and things. So, 1 and 2 Peter, you know, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. But, uh, <clears> 1 <throat> Timothy chapter 4, I'll, I'll get started in verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So people giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What are these seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Keep reading. Verse 3, forbidding to marry, look at this, and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Verse 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Everything. Oh, that just means all the, un, all the clean animals. Everything. Everything. If you want to go out and eat an earthworm, go eat an earthworm. If you see a spider crawling on the wall and you're really hungry and for some reason don't mind, <laughs> whatever, you can eat it. But just thank God for it before you put it in your mouth. See, that's the standard for a New Testament Christian. Okay, now, uh, common sense has to come in there. I mean, you don't, you know, you see a stink bug or something on the wall, you know, and you don't say, hey, you know, it's a creature of God. I can eat it. I can pray God and say thank you for it. Well, you know, use your brain a little bit there. But uh, something like uh, uh, elk, deer, cougar, bear, there's absolutely nothing wrong. And actually, you're doing your family a favor because you're not buying uh, antibiotic-laden meat. Just give you a little, uh, little heads up there for you out there. Um, I think hunting is 
is uh, very, very important actually nowadays because you go to the grocery store and you buy beef or whatever else. What they do at the factory farms, uh, if, if you don't see anything on the package saying no antibiotics used or hormone-free, well, even hormone-free, that can be iffy, but um, if it says nothing about antibiotics not being in the meat, you know, no antibiotics used or whatever else, um, what they do in factory farms is they pre-treat animals for disease, okay? Um, instead of having to deal with animals getting sick, they'll put antibiotics in the animals to avoid them getting sick. Problem is, the animal eats antibiotics, you eat the animal, you're getting the antibiotics. Now, if I come along and I'm sniffling and sneezing and hacking and stuff and, and I'm taking antibiotics for my flu, and I say, here, take some antibiotics. You'd say, I'm not taking them, I'm not sick. Oh, but you might get sick. Here, take the antibiotics. See, that doesn't make any sense. But we, what we don't realize is a lot of our meat actually has antibiotics in it. It's a problem. And what can happen is you eat that meat that has got these antibiotics in it. It goes into your stomach and you have bacteria in your stomach that help to break down the food and everything else. Healthy gut flora, you know, if you get yogurt, you'll see all these different bacteria, acidophilus and this and this and all this on the back of good yogurt. And those are the bacteria that are in there. They help enzymes and things. They help break down food in your, in your stomach. And you eat a lot of food with a lot of antibiotics. It kills all those, anti all those uh, helpful bacteria in your gut. You start having all kinds of health problems. All right. And um, again, you know, you say, well, but brother, it's more expensive. I know, I know it's more expensive. I know all that stuff and everything else. But what price do you put on your health? You know, and you say, but, you know... We're expecting the Lord to come back soon. Does it really matter? Yeah, the quality of life, and you know, we're not going to be living to be a hundred. But you know, you, know. <laughs> you got to weigh this stuff out, brother, and you got to pray about it. But the whole point is, there's nothing in the New, in the New Testament that says you cannot eat certain animals. This animal's unclean, and this, you know, the things in the Old Testament there were for the Jews, right? Not for us today as Christians. Okay, okay. Moving on here. Question number three. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 22. Uh, question, am I to flee in, into the mountains also, or is this just for children of Judea? I have a wife and two little girls. If I am working, do I get them uh, to bring with me? Okay, or to bring with. All right, well, let's read the text there. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 22. Uh, the single... I'd say the greatest chapter, the two greatest chapters right now in the church age that'll mess you up doctrinally is Matthew 24 and Acts chapter 2. Uh, those are the two biggest chapters that'll mess you up. And of course, you get into Hebrews and things, some of that. But um, Matthew 24, Acts chapter 2, when Christians try to apply it to them today, um, doesn't work. Let's look at this. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, down through 22. <clears throat> when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Most Christians today that read, they don't understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, unto them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Another big clue. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Uh, verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Okay, now let's look at the problems with applying this to a Christian today. Verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Okay, what's the holy place? What did we read, read earlier for a Christian? The holy place for a Christian is your body. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, how can you have the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, the Antichrist? How can he stand in your body? That's not what's going on there. It's talking about the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. 
That's why uh, the next verse, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. See, it's telling the people, it's the giving the location. Right now, the United States government, as of today's March 15th, 2017, they're still talking about moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Why is that significant? Because Jerusalem is the holy city of Christianity, but it's also of Judaism. Okay, we see it as a holy city because it's where Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from, Matthew chapter 5. Jerusalem is the city of the great king. All right, the Jews, they see it and they say, that's where the temple King Solomon built the temple there on the Temple Mount and everything, and, and we are supposed to be rebuilding our temple there. That's where our Messiah is going to come, and he's going to rule and you know all this other stuff. So it's sacred to the Christians. It's sacred to the Jews. But then the Catholics also try to make it sacred. Notice I didn't include Catholics with Christians because they're not Christians. The Catholics, they see it as the rebuilt temple for their Antichrist, their final pope that's coming. When you get to the highest levels, the average Catholic on the street doesn't know a thing about this. Okay, the Jesuits, they are the modern-day Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were the ones that were fighting with the Muslim hordes all the time, trying to take the city of Jerusalem. There was all this fighting down through the centuries. The Crusades, you hear about that. All right. The Knights Templar were disbanded under Jacques de Molay. He was getting into some things and stuff. The Pope burned him at the stake and the whole big story there. And uh, not going to get into that, but... Uh, the Knights, the modern-day Knights Templar, are basically the Jesuit order. And the Jesuits have the Knights of the Equestrian Order. They're right there near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. They already own, the Vatican already owns the city of Jerusalem. Okay, it was given to them back, I think, in 1993. The Vatican declared Jerusalem as a holy city. It's, international, it's an international city right now, as I speak. And they're talking about this year making... It, the, the, the Pope can freely roam throughout the city and things like this. Okay, Jerusalem is the most important city in the entire world, okay, right now. A very, very important, pivotal city. Um, but all that to say, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, what's the holy place? The rebuilt temple. The third Hebrew temple that's going to be built. And again, there's some conspiracy stuff there where you know you go to like I think Google Earth or something and uh, if you type in Temple Mount there are sometimes it'll actually show up with a rebuilt Jewish temple there so and they have they're doing all this preparation for it all the time excuse me the the red heifer and the vestments for the priests and the the, the golden menorah and all this other stuff uh, they're they're doing a lot to get ready for that third temple and so when you see the Antichrist standing in that place that's when you're to flee into the mountains, okay? But it's not talking to Christians. Why? Because if you read over in 2 Thessalonians, let's go there. See, Matthew chapter 24, let me ask you a question. Is Matthew 24 before or after Jesus died on the cross? He dies on the cross in Matthew chapter 27, three chapters later. So who is he talking to in Matthew chapter 24? Uh, it would be those that are in Judea, he's talking to Jews. There aren't any Christians present in Matthew chapter 24. Not my opinion. The disciples are called Christians first in Antioch, Acts chapter 11, verse 26. So there are no Christians in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 will mess you up doctrinally if you try to apply it to you today. Let's check this out. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 Um Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, now look at this, as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. What did we read back in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15? When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Temple of God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You see it? It's talking about the Antichrist being in that rebuilt temple that they're currently getting ready to build. Verse 5. Continue here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Most of the post-tribbers that will get you into this stuff, they won't continue reading. Because they'll say, see, what has to happen before the rapture is 
there's a great falling away, an apostasy, which is what we're in right now, all these people that call themselves Christians doing all kinds of ridiculous stuff. There has to come the falling away, and then the man of sin has to be revealed. So at the very least, we're going to be here to see the man of sin, the Antichrist, show up. But they won't keep reading, and there's a good reason for that. Verse 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, and then we'll continue down through. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he, the Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. Now, how could it, you say, well, that's the Antichrist, both references, he and, he and his. That wouldn't make any sense. Something's withholding he from re being revealed in his time. It can't be both references to the Antichrist. What's it ref in reference to? He might be revealed in his, the body of Christ's time. See, the body of Christ is still on the earth. I'm in it. You're in it if you're saved. Works out real well. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, hindering there, the hindering work of the Holy Spirit, that's the he there, until he, the body of Christ, be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders." So the Antichrist can't show up until the body of Christ is gone. You say, well, now, okay, just continue with comparing Scripture with Scripture. Let's check and see in the book of Revelation what happens when the Antichrist shows up. Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Again, you compare these scriptures here with back in the book of Daniel, the abomination of desola des desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, and you'll see that the Antichrist comes in peaceably and obtains the kingdom by flatteries, and yet by peace he'll destroy many. And if you don't understand UN peacekeeping forces, or this is a police state action to bring p peace to the area, it's war. It's the or Orwellian doublethink of the modern day. All right, uh, Peacekeeping missions are oftentimes uh, a good cover-up way to say, we're going in there and we're going to kill everybody. <laughs> you know, we'll have peace when they're dead. You know, when they say peace, we're going to make, the, we're going to make peace. What they really mean is peace is. You know, instead of P-E-A-C-E, -E, it's P-I-E-C-E-S. That's the kind of peace there. <laughs> but... You say, what's Revelation 6 have to, how does that prove 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that, you know, the body of Christ leaves beforehand? Very simple. Again, let's count, children. Revelation chapter 6. Let's go back a page to Revelation chapter 5. Does 5 come before 6? Yes. I know this is hard for some of the post tripers out there. I'm not making fun of you, brother, that's, you know, wrote the letter. Saying some of the people that are going to be writing the comments, he didn't prove anything. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy, worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. Okay? The angels there, in the resurrection, we are as the angels of God. But those 24 elders represent Christians. We're redeemed to God by thy blood. They're saying to the Lamb, to Jesus Christ. So you have 24 elders in heaven, on thrones, with crowns on their head. Again, the crowns are given at the judgment seat of Christ. So there are Christians in heaven those 24 elders, and then the great multitude of angels that are there, there are the great, the 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, the angels that are there, and the 24 elders are Christians in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed. 
lines up perfectly with what goes on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. So, and there's plenty of other scriptures too that would prove that the you know, body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble, before Matthew 20, chapter 24 takes place. And of course, there are signs there that are given in the early part of Matthew 24, um, verses 6 through 8. Let's read that. Matthew 24, verse 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We are in that time period right now. There's massive famines in Africa right now. There's talk of war with China, talk of war with North Korea. Iran is threatening war. They're doing test things and military operations and exercises. Russia's back and forth and Turkey's making threats. And, and you know, to stay out of the South China Sea, says China and the Philippines are saying, we'll go to the South China Sea. And Japan's saying, we're going to send down a new destroyer. All this stuff is like within the last couple of days, I'm talking. It's just saber rattling like crazy right now. You don't know what that expression means. Back in the old days, they would take their saber and they would rattle it in the scabbard, basically, and rattle it kind of like, don't make me pull this thing, you know, kind of like taking a gun and kind of cocking the hammer to the, you know, half cock type of thing. Not the fool, but just, you know, are we going to have a problem? You know, <laughs> that's what the different nations are doing right now. Perfectly in line with Je what Jesus Christ said in the early part of Matthew 24. All right. Those, that's the beginning of the sorrows that are coming. We are in that time period right now. But the Antichrist cannot show up until the body of Christ is gone. We withhold the Antichrist. I mean, think about it. Any kind of thing that lines up with Bible prophecy, Bible-believing Christians are first out there. Guess what? Latest news. Hottest thing. Check it out. This guy said such and such. Lines up with Bible prophecy. See? We're hindering the work of the Antichrist. I mean, imagine just wipe out every single Bible-believing ministry online. No Bible-believing Christians can say anything. How much faster would this world degenerate? Do you ever think about that? I remember a brother said, you know, as dark as things, as, dark as things are right now, can you imagine what's going to happen when the body of Christ leaves? You wonder, how is it going to be so bad in this time of Jacob's trouble? It's because the body of Christ is gone. You say, well, who's going to do the witnessing? That's one of, another one of these supposed arguments that they use. Um, the Holy Spirit is not leaving. All right? The he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The taken out of the way is the, the body of Christ, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's omnipresent. The Holy Spirit through the body of Christ is hindering the Antichrist right now. The Holy Spirit will inspire us to see things and say, whoa, and expose things. But the body of Christ is what leaves. And then the Holy Spirit, there's going to be a whole lot of people that realize, oh, nuts, I wasn't saved after that. And it's not that they didn't receive the love of the truth. Again, this is all major study stuff, but it's just that you have some people that never heard the gospel. They've been deceived into whatever things and stuff like that, and, and they just didn't make it to the rapture. And the Lord has that stuff figured out and everything else, and I'm not about to try and figure it out. But getting back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 16, Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Bible prophecy being fulfilled. Again, the Jews that are over there in Judea, when they see the Antichrist standing in that temple, the rebuilt temple, because, see, I think the way I believe that this thing's going to work out, just to give you a little uh, prophecy thing here, the way I believe it's going to work out is um, I believe that there's going to be a war. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I'm not going to give it away because we're going to be talking about this in another video. But uh, basically, it's going to be a war between between Islam and, you know, Christendom, which in in you know news media terms that means Catholicism, <laughs> okay. And but Protestants are going to join with it. Uh, we're already in that war, by the way. These wars with uh, Muslim terrorist nations and let's go wipe out ISIS and all this other stuff. We're already fighting another crusade, a modern day crusade, of quote unquote Christian nations against. Muslim forces, all right? So the war has already begun, but it's going to heat up in the future. And at some point in time in that war, and I have a theory about that I'll be talking about in another upcoming video, sometime in that war, the rapture is going to happen, the body of Christ is going to leave. 
and it's going to be such an atrocious, horrible thing people are going to see. The children have disappeared, and it's just going to be like, oh, this is terrible. It's just going to be horrible, and the Antichrist is going to show up somewhere in that time period, and he's going to come and he's going to restore peace um, in the sense of um, he's going to make a, a peace treaty between the Jews and the Palestinians over there in the land of Israel. And, um, and he's basically going to give them the right to build their third temple. And while that temple is being built, it's going to be probably three and a half years to build the thing. And when it's done, the Antichrist is basically going to come in and say, hey, this is really nice. I'm going to stay here now. And um, by the way, I'm God. Now, when the Jews that are over there in Judea, when they see that, they're going to say, well, wait a second. Um, hmm. Whether or not they've thought the guy was their Messiah or just, oh, he's a, another Catholic over here, you know, this uh, final pope or whatever they're calling him. And they're going to look and they're going to go, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, I think we better leave. And they're going to flee out into the mountains. And, of course, you go into the, through the, the events of the future then, and then the Antichrist basically is wiping out everybody else, and he goes out to try and destroy those few remaining Jews. Battle of Armageddon, Jesus comes back down and, and ends the Antichrist reign. So this passage is about the Jews in that time period. Christians are gone before this even happens. Okay, We are in the beginning of sorrows right now. The beginning of sorrows. It's going to get a whole lot worse, in other words, than what our current world is. That's a thought. But when the hindrance there on the spirit of Antichrist, when the body of Christ leaves, it's going to get real bad at that point in time. And that's what that's talking about right there. And notice verse 20, Matthew chapter 24, verse 20. And But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Okay? Keep your hand right there in Matthew 24. Go to Romans chapter 13. Again, I'm going to show you, just as we saw earlier with the book of Leviticus, um, what you do is you compare things in the Old Testament with what we have here today, our instructions for Christians, mostly in the Pauline epistles. All right? um, Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Now remember it said, your flight you know, there in, in uh, verse 20, neither on the Sabbath day, Pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath day, essentially. You're in, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to fly. It, uh, just flight can also mean running. You're making flight. You're running away. But look at Romans chapter 13, verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All right, uh, where's the thing about keeping the Sabbath day? It's not there. Christians don't have to keep the Sabbath day. You can worship the Lord, and I strongly encourage you to worship the Lord seven days a week. All right, if you want to get together, the assembling of, you know, a bunch of saints getting together and, and talking about the Word, going out witnessing, whatever else, um, you can do that on a Sunday, you can do that on a Saturday, you can do it on a Friday or a Monday or Tuesday evening, you know, whenever. Uh, whatever works out. It's flexible. Um, that's why we're not supposed to have buildings called churches in the New Testament. There aren't any. And you get into that stuff, you get into the rigid structure of, of uh, Roman Catholic uh, organized religion. All right. The body of Christ is supposed to be flexible. So again, back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 20. Again, it's not pointed at a Christian. Who is this pointed at? Keeping the Sabbath day. Well, again, another big study, but the Sabbath day was given to the nation of Israel as a sign. Uh, I have a whole study on the thing of the Sabbath day. Should Christians keep the Sabbath day? Something to that effect. can't think of the exact wording of the title of the sermon, but you can look it up. Just type in Sabbath and you'll see the video uh, that I did on it. But uh, that's what it's talking about in this passage here. So um, you're not going to be there to see the Antichrist standing up in the holy place. Your body is the holy temple right now. Uh, we're not going to be here to see the Antichrist even show up. I know some of the brethren are trying to teach that now, that uh, the Antichrist is going to show up, and then shortly after that the body of Christ leaves. Can't happen. Can't happen. Why? Because the body of Christ is in heaven, represented by the 24 elders and the great, the, the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels there. Um, that is 
representing the body of Christ. And they're in heaven before the Antichrist is unleashed in, in uh, Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Right? We are hindering the Antichrist from showing up. And if the Antichrist dared to show up with the body of Christ still on the earth, we'd be out there pointing out who he is. All right, you know, we would. So, kind of a long answer on that one, but uh, I needed to go over a bunch of scriptures. Okay, question number four. Um, I own a 1985 Chevy Blazer, daily driver, 1986 Chevy pickup for hunting, hunting bow for elk, hunting rifle for deer, cougar, and bear, and a YFZ 450 ATV I use on dunes for fun. Question, are these things not good to own? Okay, um, no, they're not. Make sure you send them all here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, this is a question that's very near and dear to my heart because uh, I am, I, I don't know if I've said a whole lot about this in other studies, but I am an um, old truck and ATV motorcycle kind of a guy. I started riding motorcycles when I was 10 years old and it's very much in my blood. Um, I know uh, he said that he had a tattoo of a Yamaha Banshee. I've had three Banshees over the years. Um, I love ATVs and motorcycles. Okay, uh, I drive right now. I currently have a 1979 Ford truck, a 1979 Jeep Wagoneer, um, and I have we have two different ATVs. Up here, there, you know, we have ATV trails, huge networks of ATV trails everywhere. So they're, they're transportation, but you know, they're, they are still are fun. Um, back years ago, before I met my wife, just to give you a little story to prove the point here, um, I had, uh, I'd done some work and things and I was saving up some money and, and yeah, I was a single guy and I didn't have that many bills or responsibilities. And it'd been many, many years that I had didn't, hadn't had a motorcycle. And so I'd, started doing some shopping around online and what would I like to get. Ended up getting a, a 1998 Honda VTR 1000. Um, they call them Firestorms over in the UK. Uh, Super Hulk. It's basically the Honda, Honda version of a Ducati motorcycle. It's a V-twin sport bike. Um, I'm not going to put any pictures or anything up. Uh, there's actually a video I did on a channel, uh, BTD Husky 394 XP, I think, channel. And it's of me... I was selling my, my Honda Super Hawk and I did a video and you can see me standing there with the bike and everything else. But it was a rocket bike and uh, very fast, uh, not, not real like fast high speed, but really, really you know, strong torquey motor, uh, just really tremendous in the corners and things. But, um, you know, and I had all the riding gear and everything else, you know, and, and, uh, I would like to go out, you know, I'd get done Sunday afternoon, we'd have our house church meeting, preach that, and then while the sermon was being rendered, I was just recording audio back in those days, 2009 to 2011, uh, right in there, basically when this was going on, and I'd go for rides on my motorcycle, and uh, at first it was, you know, just fun and things, and, and you know, the bikes go very fast, and so I'd have the times I'd get out in the back roads, and I'd you know, just test the throttle to make sure it works okay and the carburetors are cleaned out and all that stuff, you know. And, uh, you know, I started to see the bike was really, really fast and and, uh, and I'd end up looking for people, you know. I like to humiliate guys with Harley Davidsons and I'd go, you know, up and let them think that, you know, I'd push them a little bit, get behind them, act like I'm going to pass and they'd take off and they, you know, in front of me and, and I'd play with them for a little bit and then just, past them, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and speeds excess way up above, you know, 120, 150 miles an hour in there. And you say, you did this in ministry. And, um, so went for a little while and, and, you know, the thing was like, did wheelies and, you know, and it started to become very, very carnal and it was like this pride thing and stuff. And the Lord started to con convict me and I thought, you know what, I got to get rid of this bike. And uh, so I sold it. It just, you know, and it was a good decision. I made the right move, of course. You know, I got a more, a calmer motorcycle. And I just enjoyed riding that thing. It was a KLR 650 Kawasaki, just dual sport. And, um, you know, I'm just, I was a big time motorhead and still am in many ways. 
Um, my experience with these things, to answer your question, is uh, can you ride it without it going to your head? Can you drive it without it going to your head? If you got really loud exhaust on your truck, um, does it give you a feeling of pride? Does that pride, uh, is it making problems? That's the issue. Uh, if you're just looking and saying, you know what, it's an older vehicle, it's, you know, yeah, it's got a big motor, yes, it sounds really good, but you know what, I don't want a newer vehicle, I don't like the newer trucks, there's all the computer stuff and fuel injection and all this other stuff that I can't work on. I like my old vehicles because I like to work on them. Um, that's basically where I'm at right now. Uh, so, uh, does it turn into pride? That's the issue. Uh, your four-wheeler, there's nothing wrong with having a four-wheeler, having some fun and things like that. Um, Lord does not expect us to live monastic lives of just like sitting in burlap and like sitting there staring at a wall and just like prayers all the time and just like studying the scriptures and just this boring monotonous st studying the scriptures is not boring please understand <laughs> but you, you know what i'm saying the lord expects us i mean he created why did he create nature for lost people no the lord created nature for our enjoyment and you know uh, some of my most in, enjoyable times i mean my my little boy um uh, we've had some great times. I mean, he was literally just a few months old and we we're taking him on the ATV trails in the springtime. And, uh, you know, he's in a little chest carrier thing. And I mean, I'm not going like, you know, flying down the trails, you know, going around the corners, getting the thing sideways. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, just enjoying the, the ride, just going like, you know, five miles an hour, just putting along on an ATV and he'd go to sleep and he just, he would always loved nap time when we were going on the ATV trails. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Um, if it's becoming a pride thing where you're out there and you're looking for other riders and you see some other guy, it's like you're riding up and you're like, oh, I want to race, I want to race. And then you, you beat him and you feel that, oh, that adrenaline rush of like, I just whipped that guy. That's where you got to watch out, okay? Same thing applies for your trucks. Um, as far as your guns and things are concerned, uh, like I said, I didn't really finish what I was saying. I kind of got sidetracked earlier. <laughs> But uh, the thing of going out hunting wild meat, wild game meat is very extremely healthy. Obviously, there's no antibiotics in it. It's raised um, very well. So you're doing your family a favor when you hunt uh, and fish and things like that and, and get good, clean meat for your family. So no, there's no problem with your bow or your guns or your trucks and, and your ATV if there's no pride attached to it. Watch that, okay? And, you know, if you start to feel some pride there, by the way, too, brother, um, just I, I can speak again from experience. You don't have to totally say no to any motorcycles or ATVs or anything. Just get something that's calmer, all right, that you're not going to be going and flying around and, you know. So question number five, I conceal carry in the woods also into town. Question. Is it okay to kill if someone was surely going to kill your wife or children? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, absolutely. Uh, just give you a scripture on that. Um, give you the one in the New Testament here as far as Christians and weapons. Luke chapter 22, verse... Uh, 36, Jesus speaking here, he says, then, then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. A sword was the weapon of choice for that day. So if it was in modern times, it would be a gun. Okay. Obviously, if you have a sword and you're pretty far away from some guy and he's got a gun, you're not going to be winning, winning in the fight. And if that guy's intending to come and hurt you and your wife and your daughters, you got to take that guy down. And you say, well, we're in the UK. We can't have guns over here. Okay, then get a sword. Well, we can't have swords. Then get a baseball bat. The point is, fight off uh, somebody like that. You should not be a pacifist. And I'll show you the reason for that. Uh, I'm trying to think of where this scripture's at. Okay. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. 
All right, very important there. Remember that verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. What's going on there? Well, if you have some guy that he goes out and he's a first-time criminal, and he gets bold and he takes his gun and he goes over and he says, Hey, you, give me your money. And the guy goes, Oh, sure, sure, sure. You know, here, and he pulls out his wallet, and there, 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 and stuff. And the guy goes, and kills the guy. At first, it's a shock. You know, Man, I can't believe I just took somebody's life. But hey, I got the money. I got to get out of here. And he goes away. I need more money. He goes out again. Hey, what did I learned from that last time. He goes out, hey, you, give me your money. Here's the money. He shoots him, looks down, and he goes, hmm, saw that before. He goes away. Third time he needs the money. Each time he gets bolder and bolder and bolder and bolder. You see? Now that same guy goes out the first time and he goes, hey, give me your money. And you say, okay, yeah, here's the money. Throw the wallet over there on the ground. The guy turns around to get it and you say, drop your gun. And he turns around and he goes, huh, and you go, and you shoot the guy. Hit the uh, judgment there. Because, excuse me, sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Uh, then their, their hearts are fully set in them to do evil. But reverse that. You just put sentence against that criminal. He's got a gun. He's going to kill you. You kill him instead. Boom. You're not trying to take his money from him. All you're trying to do is preserve your life and your wife and your two daughters sitting over in the vehicle. You see? You kill the guy. Problem solved. Or, you know, we should call the police. There's no time to call the police. Obviously, ex, you know, you escalate the level of violence according, you know, accordingly. If the guy comes up and says, hey, you know, I'm going to hit you, or and he's got like this, and you look at his hands, and there's no, there's no gun there or anything, you know, he's just like this, don't shoot the guy. I mean, you don't need to do that. I mean, okay. If he comes up and he's, you know, pull my pocket knife out here, he's like this, and he's got a knife, you know, he's going to stab you like this. Uh, you know, well, okay, now we got a problem. This is a deadly weapon, all right? So, uh, and yes, you know, this is a big knife. I realize somebody's probably going, it's too big a knife. Uh, everything I do, people find fault with it. You know, this is, I got my work pants on right now. This is my work knife, you know. <laughs> but the whole point is, um, you know, fight. All right, you fight off somebody like that. If they're a criminal, you're doing society a favor by taking that criminal down. Um, so try to avoid confrontation. Don't again, it can lead to pride. You got some big, you know, 45 ACP, or you know, you're packing whatever else, um, you know, or some snub nose 454 Casul or something crazy or ridiculous. Uh, don't actually do that because you get the real big guns. There's too much velocity and the bullet and everything else to go right through the guy. Um, new guy that that happened to. Um, so actually, I'll tell you a real, real quick little story here just to illustrate my point. Um, this guy was driving in his vehicle, work van, and he gets to a light in the city. And some guy comes up, puts a gun right to his forehead. You know, he's sitting there and he puts the gun right in and he says, give me your money. And he goes, oh, yeah, okay, all right, all right, all right. And he goes, let me get my wallet. It's down here in the center console. He leans down. Instead of grabbing his wallet, he grabs, he had a 454 Casul, very big gun. He takes it and goes, bump, right against the door and, and shoots through his van door, hits this guy, through him, and over and, and goes into the wall of a home. <laughs> okay? That's too much gun to carry for self-defense. But, you know, that's... Just to illustrate the point, he was right in shooting the guy, all right, but uh, he didn't do a good job because the guy just, the guy lived, bullet went right through him. But you know that can lead to pride, is what I'm saying. So again, you know if you have a concealed carry thing, you're doing that, you're carrying guns and things, that's great. I'm all for that. Um, I believe very much in that myself. But uh, if it, can, if it becomes a cocky, arrogant thing and you got an attitude and a chip on your shoulder, uh, you're not out there to be gunslinging outlaw from the Old West. You're out there trying to preserve life, trying to protect the lives of yourself and your wife and your daughters. Uh, that's what you're trying to do. So, uh,
Okay. Just a little personal note there to me at the end, but if you're watching, hopefully I've answered your questions. If not, uh, get back to me and I'll, I'll, you know, with other questions that you might have, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. But that's how I would answer those questions. Um, you know, a lot of that's very, like I said, very near to me because it's, you know, I've struggled over the years with the thing of motorcycles and old vehicles and, you know, concealed carry guns. And, you know, you got to be careful as a Christian not to get proud and not to think that your strength comes from things here on this earth. Uh, when it gets right down to it, your strength comes from the Lord. And that doesn't mean that you just simply say, well, then I don't need guns or I don't need ways to protect myself. Um, God gives you common sense. And the Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 22, verse 36, um, to his disciples, if you don't have a sword, then sell your garment and buy one. Um, why? Because the reality of this world is Satan is the God of this world, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And there's a lot of people that follow Satan. And um, do what you can to witness to people. Absolutely. But if you meet somebody that is, that is bent on taking your life, or your loved one's life or something like that, then use whatever means necessary to uh, eliminate that person. Quite simple. And, you know, again, the Lord's going to keep you out of most of these situations. But there have been Christians that have had to defend themselves. Uh, this isn't about, you know, some kind of an Islamic war, jihad or something stupid nonsense like that, going out and, and bringing the war to the heathen. No, 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 no. Uh, we are not aggressors. We are defenders. All right, so hopefully I've answered your questions. I think, um, I don't think if there's anything else I'm going to do with that. So uh, that is going to be it for this answer video. Um, again, if anybody out there wants to have uh, questions answered and things like that, um, you know, I've, I have had people write me and things, and they'll ask very detailed, very difficult questions, and I'm like, uh, you know, this is going to take a big sermon to do this, and I'm going to have to do a lot of research. Um, I actually had a brother send me something, a uh, very interesting comment. He said the thing about, what about fermented grape juice? Could that really be called, uh, was it fermented grape juice that Jesus was using, you know, uh, to represent his blood? Because if it's fermented, that's like leaven. So, you know, how could you have fermented grape juice symbolizing the blood of Jesus Christ? It'd be impure. And... You know, the true Orthodox Jewish thing of using the grape juice, you know, as the, the wine there for different, you know, holiday type celebrations and things is not supposed to be fermented. And uh, this is a good point. I need to do more research into that, but I'll get these good ones like that. And, I'm, you know, it's like I got to do more research on that before I can really come out and talk about it. I need to get more inform information, but something like that I can answer. And uh, many times I'll just share it online because other people struggle with it too. So hopefully I've answered your questions. If not, please write to me again. Uh, spell out what you want. Or, you know, and, and too, if you want to write me and say, you know, I just want to reply back, don't make a video about it. Let me know in your letter uh, to anybody out there. And I will not. I'll write back when I can. Um, and uh, I won't make any kind of videos or anything else. And I will never share anybody's name unless I'm told to do that. Unless they say, T please tell my name, whatever. Okay, so that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.